Man, it's good to live for God. I pity folk that only have religion and no relationship. They just have church going, but they don't have nothing going on in their spirit. They just show up, but nothing really changes in their life. They just punch a clock, leave the same way that they came. But there's a church in this town. I said there's a church in this town. Well, we're kind of crazy about our Jesus. We don't mind anybody knowing that we're in love with him. We want to worship him from the bottom of our being to the top of where we're going to go. Man, I feel the Holy Ghost in this tabernacle here tonight. Why don't somebody put your hands together and help me love the Lord? He's a great God. Woo! Come on, somebody shout to the Lord. Open your mouth and praise him. Ah, oh, he's a holy God. You're a holy, 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 holy God. My, 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 my. What a, what a treat to be in the house of the Lord. It's so good to be here with your incredible pastor and wife and daughter. And uh, I know you've probably heard this as you were t talking tonight once or twice, maybe three times. But you are blessed beyond measure for the incredible anointed apostolic leadership that you have leading you. I love and respect your pastor and his good wife. And, and God has given us the privilege to work on a few little projects together in the kingdom of the Lord. And God's not through and you're not through. And I think the greatest days of our living is ahead of us. And uh, your most exciting day you haven't lived yet. Your greatest miracle you haven't seen yet. You haven't seen the next sanctuary yet. You haven't seen the next revival yet. Come on, somebody to start looking up. Oh, hallelujah. God's on the throne. And uh, so appreciate their fellowship. They are given to hospitality. That is a, that is a gifting of God. And uh, thank you for, whew, we're sleeping in the Taj Mahal down the hall, Taj Mahal. And, and uh, man, they know how to cook here in Memphis. And uh, it's the first place I ever ate barbecued spaghetti. Memphis. I've told the whole world about it. And they just kind of look at me a little crooked. But just stay out of Memphis. I'll eat it. It's, it's good stuff. Anybody ready to have a little bit of church? I, I want to I wanna please the Lord. I want to I wanna do what he, he's asking me to do and do my best to, to get into his book. I love the Word of God, and uh, my wife and I are just a few days from getting on a plane and headed back to the Philippines. We've been working there for 23 years. The last two plus years, we've not been able to be there because of this Wuhan flu and I'm glad I'm glad you're you're over it because I've been over it I've been over it and so when you run out of things to pray for pray for us we're going to hit the ground running, got a lot, to, a lot of work to do. But, but knowing that there are churches like this one who are connected in prayer means the whole world to us. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Psalms. Psalm 1, 
37 country it's good to see you now y'all may not know who I'm talking to but she knows who I'm talking to and uh, I've not got to meet her husband yet but I've heard a lot about him he's probably the most prayed for husband in the world and um, it's good to see her little grinning face here tonight God bless her Psalm 137, ask your neighbor if they're ready. Are you ready? Y'all don't sound like it. Ask somebody else. You ready? By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down, verse 1. Yea, we wept. When we remembered Zion, we hanged our harps upon the willows in the midst thereof. For they, there they that carried us away captive required of us a song. And they that wasted us required of us mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. But God's people replied, How shall we sing the Lord's song? song in a strange land how do we do this how do we sing the Lord's song in a strange land so for a few moments I want to preach to you about the Lord's song in a strange land now let's put our Bibles down and throw our hands high let's ask God to anoint us together Savior I love you I thank you. I worship you. You're everything to me. Thank you for your moving this entire day. Thank you for visiting us. Thank you for walking into our house. Thank you for what you're doing in our life. Touch us. Help us. Let your will be done among us tonight, I pray. In Jesus' righteous name. And before you're seated, one more time, would you clap your hands under the Lord? And somebody shout with a voice of triumph. He's a great God. Oh, hallelujah. Amen. You may be seated. It's an interesting text of Scripture. When I read about the people of God, being in a place called Babylon. It is, a, it is a mixed bag at best to say in the same, same sentence, by the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down, yea, we wept. For most of us that's in this house tonight we we all have an inherent understanding that when we talk about Babylon we are talking about the world we are not talking about a place of righteousness but rather we are talking about a condition we are talking about an ungodly environment an atmosphere that is not conducive to the living of the people of God. However, in order for us to get there, we, we have to reverse engineer this scripturally and take a journey in reverse to find where we first heard of Babylon. When I look into the word of God, I... I find that, that Babel was a place where man first made a choice. That I am not going to entirely place my trust in the Word of God. So therefore I will have a plan B. And it was there in a place called Babel that the minds of men came together. They coalesced and ignoring a vibrant bow in the heavens, 
they said amongst themselves, peradventure, that the word of God is not true. And peradventure, that he changed his mind. God has given us intellect. God has given us the ability to fend for ourselves. And so instead of placing all my hope on a covenant, you let me preach tonight. Instead of placing all my trust on the word of God of whom I cannot see, I'm going to take God-given ability and I will build my own escape. And I will do my best to find a way that should he change his mind, I don't perish. You know the story. And so they begin to build a tower, the Bible says, whose tops reached into the heaven. In fact, they were not just determined, they were talented. They were not just talented, they were motivated. They weren't just motivated, they were incredibly skilled in making such progress that God himself said, I think I'm going to have to get involved in this issue. You know the story, you've preached it, taught it, heard it all your life. And so it was there that God stepped into this arena. Now, I'm, I'm sure it's not been that long since y'all were in building projects and it won't be long till you get into another one. And so you understand the value. And it, don't, don't get quiet on me. Just say amen because you know that's where you're headed. And, and you know the value in any kind of a construction project to have good communication. Because communication is of utmost importance and and so we got a tower being built and we got a tower going on. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden, the, 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 the men that were mixing the, the, the mortar, uh, when the bricklayer looked down from the scaffold and said, instead of me moving this scaffold by myself, I need you to move this for me a little bit. But when he was speaking in English, they were hearing it in Spanish. And so real quickly, the, the progress, the momentum, it came to a screeching halt because there was a lack of communication. And people could not communicate. Now I remember, I remember... Uh, in one of my uh, language uh, learning uh, sessions of life. I remember when I was really uh, working on my Spanish and I remember that uh, I, I was getting very comfortable and I was good conversationally, but uh, when I got into the Word of God and when I got into uh, biblical terms and church language, it was, it's not stuff spoken on the street. And I had hood Spanish and, and street Spanish. And, 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 and to the English ear, to the English ear, the word for fish is pescado. But the word for sin is pecados. And so the, the, to, the, to the English ear, pecados, pescado, it's pretty similar. And, and I remember teaching a Bible study in Spanish. And I told the man that he needed to be baptized for the remission of his pescado his fish. And he said, pescado. I said, no, pecados. So, so very quickly you could understand if pescado means fish or pecado means sin, you could understand how quickly the progress of mankind was brought to a stop because of confusion. And, 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 so, and so it was confusion that began the separation of mankind. I don't have time to preach all of that. But it was confusion that brought divisions. It was confusion that brought separation. Here you go, buddy. Stay on the scaffold, baby. Stay on the scaffold. It was confusion that caused people to segregate. I'm going to 
gonna preach a little bit here. It was confusion that caused people to find their own pockets and find their own cultures and find their own tongues and find their own languages. And so when we look back into the scripture and we talk about Babylon, you must understand its origin. You must understand that Babylon was not just a theory. It wasn't just a philosophy. It wasn't just a place, but it was the fruit of confusion. It was the child, it was the brainchild of man saying, I'm gonna do it my own way. It was the brainchild of man saying, I'm not gonna put all my trust in God. It was the brainchild of plan B. It was the questioning of divine authority and divine integrity. And man said, I think I'm gonna do this myself. So I want you to understand tonight when I talk about Babylon that I am talking about the, 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 the epicenter of confusion. I am talking about the fountainhead of, 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 of divisions and, and separations and, and segregation. It's where it all began when man could no longer communicate. Where the scripture finds us is in one of the darkest history periods of Israel. And it was some, somehow uh, somewhere between 597 B.C. to 538 B.C. is what uh, theologians and historians call the Babylonian Empire. It was a type of the uh, time of the captivity, pardon me, of the people of God in Babylon. It was a gruesome time. It was a, a, a things happen unmentionable from this pulpit tonight. It was a time that was scary. It was a time that was fraught with unspeakable torture, unspeakable butchering of the people of God. It was during this time of captivity that God's people were in the crosshairs of everything devious and deviant and demonic. It was during this time that anything righteous was mocked and anything righteous uh, was uh, accused and attacked. Uh, the Babylonian empire or the Babylonian captivity, pardon me, was not just another phase uh, of their life, uh, but something was loosed uh, in the minds and spirits uh, of the people of God that writhed beneath the tyrannical heel of Babylonian captivity. It, it was crucial cruel and wicked. It was filled with evils that, that if you want to, uh, you have fun reading all about it. But it was a gruesome time for God's people. It was a time that they were carried away captive. They were taken away from their homeland. They were forbidden to speak their own language. They were taught the language uh, of the Babylonians. It was then that they were forced to worship Baal. They were taken from their fathers. They were taken away from their forefathers. They were mocked for their image. They were mocked for their culture. They were mocked for the way that they lived their life. Let me preach to you right now. And it was during that time that Lamentations was written. It was during that time that the men of God would lament and cry about the people of God because they are suffering so in Babylonian captivity. It was then that they wrote and said, her adversaries are the chief and her enemies are prospering upon her. For the Lord hath afflicted her for the multitude of her transgressions. Please hear me when I tell you it was a concentrated attack against the culture preach this tonight against the culture of the people of God it was I'm going to not just destroy you I wanted to destroy your culture I can take you out but that's not going to take out your culture but if I can somehow confuse you and get into your mind and get into your spirit I'm going to destroy your ability to hold your life fast to the spoken word of God and have absolute trust that if God said it uh, like you sang it, uh, he's going to do it. Uh, he's going to perform it uh, simply because he said it. Clap your hands with me. 
Amen. And so this is where I read tonight. The king of Babylon at this time, his name is Nebuchadnezzar. Ah, oh, Jesus. Nebuchadnezzar was one of several kings. Is this okay I take just a few moments? He was one of several kings. You read in your Bible, there were times that kings came together. There were times that kings coalesced, not, not in times of war, but in times of camaraderie, sharing some of the same beautiful places on the earth. And kings would talk. Nebuchadnezzar talked with Pharaoh. Pharaoh with Nebuchadnezzar. They compared notes. They talked about this people. Trust me when I tell you tonight that no matter where they went, ultimately those people found their way into their discussion. Those people, those people that live different, those people that walk different, those people that live around this tent, those people that are always making sacrifice, those people, they would talk about those people. I wonder how many kings asked Pharaoh, Pharaoh, how in the world did you let them go? You had them in the palm of your hand. You had them for 400 years. They were enslaved to you. You owned them. You controlled them. They built your nation. They, they built your wealth. They built your roads. How in the world could you have had those people? Yet those people got away. I, 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 I'm just, I'm a fly on the wall listening to the conversation of kings concerning Nebuchadnezzar making notes. Pharaoh, I watched what you did. You increased their burden. You increased their labor. Pharaoh, we all watched. We all watched as you really got hard with their women. We all watched as you really taxed those women, thinking that it would stop the birth rate of those people. But we all noticed, Pharaoh, that the harder that you worked them, the stronger that they got, and the bigger children that they had, and the more babies that they had. And so, oh, Nebuchadnezzar's making notes. That's not where I'm going to go. But Nebuchadnezzar also understood. I don't know what this is all about, but I'm sure every king discovered it and every king discussed it. I don't know about those people, but every now and then they stir up those old men. Every now and then, every now and then I watch them and those old men go in that tent. And when those old men come out of that tent, they got that crazy box on their shoulders. I don't know what's in that box. I don't know why they put it on their shoulders but every time we've been about to wipe them off the face of the earth them old people brought the box out and when they brought that box out I watched the sun stand still I've seen pillars of fire I've seen pillars of cloud I don't know what's going on with those people <laughs> Nebuchadnezzar realized it didn't happen physically because the more he taxed them physically, the stronger they got. And so the tactic of Babel is I'm not going to fight them physically. Another thing that Nebuchadnezzar noted was, Pharaoh, you made a big mistake and a bad one when you left them all together. I did my math and I've counted 12 tribes, but you never separated them. You always left them together. And when one was down, the other was up. 
And when one was sad, the other was happy. And so you never could control them because you kept them all together. But if you watch what Nebuchadnezzar did in the Babylonian captivity, the very first thing that Nebuchadnezzar did was he separated the tribe of Judah first. He said, one thing I've learned, if I can shut them up, if I can stop them from singing, if I can stop them from praising, if I can stop them from worshiping, Nebuchadnezzar realized, uh, if I'm going to destroy this culture, and if I'm going to destroy this people, then the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to shut down the choir, and I'm going to shut down the music, and I'm going to shut down the song, and I'm going to shut down the singers, uh, because I've watched those singers walk in there on a sleepy Sunday morning and get to singing and the glory of whatever begin to move in that tabernacle and something powerful always happens. Social distancing didn't start with Fauci. Now, if you're, if you're the nervous type, I'll give you like 15 seconds to go. The separation didn't start with him. The social distancing didn't start with him. It starts with the spirit of Babel. Where I live, the man who calls himself governor, where I live, told me last November, if you love your family, don't have Thanksgiving. He told me the following month, if you love your family, don't have Christmas. And they, he began to pipe the message of Babel. If you love them, don't touch them. If you love them, separate from them. You can't help them if you get close. You got to help them by separating from them. You got to shut it all down. I'm going to preach a few more moments here. If you're really going to be effective, then, then put a diaper on your head and run away from the rest of the world. If you love your wife, don't talk to her. If you love your children, don't talk to them. If you love your brother, don't touch him. Turn your back on him and ignore him. And Babel says that's love. I was, in a, I was in a big box store that I've shopped in for 30 years there in San Diego, close to several months ago. And the manager of that store, whom I know very well, very well, many building projects with him, he walked up to me. I was there buying some stuff, you know, and no, nobody's touching people wearing gloves and, you know, in hazmat suits. And this is nothing new. You stay with me tonight. And, and he came up to me and he said, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. Just like that, not hello, good morning, praise the Lord. How you doing? Good to see you, pastor. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. I said, what are you talking about? He said, I saw your church on TV last night. Oh, you did? She said, yeah, the news was reporting. How's it feel to be a super spreader? I said, it feels awesome. But we're spreading the Holy Ghost. That's what we're doing. I told you, if you're nervous, I gave you a chance to leave. How does it feel? How does it feel to be a so-called man of the cloth and have hate and disrespect? In your life, what are you talking about? He said, don't you know we are mandated by our government? Don't you understand you are breaking the law? Don't you understand if you really love those people, you wouldn't have church? I'm just smiling. I'm saying, get it off your chest, buddy, because when you get done, I'm going to finish this conversation. And he began to read me the right act, Pastor, in front of God and everybody in a very large, big box store. And when he got done, I said, I've listened to you. Now you listen to me. Yeah. 
before you say another word to me. Have, where in the world are we having this conversation? I said, how many hundred people are in this building right now? Have you shut your building down? Have you fired your employees? Have you laid everybody off? Have you shut your doors? And all you do is sell building equipment. I said, have you protested the abortion clinics? Have you shut down the liquor store? Have you paraded? I'm going to preach a little while. Have you paraded in front of the dope shops? And you want to stand here and read me the right act? He said, I didn't mean to make you mad. I said, you done made me mad. I said, if anybody's door ought to be open, it ought to be a one God Jesus name, tongue talking church that has the only message that's going to get somebody out of the clutches of Babel. He said, well, let's go back in my office. I said, no, I no, right here, right here. Right, I want to preach to somebody tonight. I want to preach to somebody. Nebuchadnezzar understood. My battle next time is not going to be physical. I'm going to be mental. I'm going to work in their mind. I'm going to work in their spirit. I'm going to get in that invisible part of their life. I'm going to deal with their emotions. Because if I can get there, I can cause them to hang it up. If I can get there, I can cause them to throw it all away. If I can get there, I can cause them to surrender but I'm going to preach tonight uh, there has never been a greater hour for one God Jesus name revival than the hour that we live in right now come on clap your hands with me you read your Bible and you read your history every single without exception crisis has been a positioning for the church Let me finish my introduction here and I'm going to preach my message. Every single time. I told your pastor this morning, I said I felt so much stuff. It's the only way I could say it. I felt a lot when I walked in there today and in the spirit. He said, what did you feel? I said, probably the greatest thing that I could articulate is I kept feeling position. God's positioned us. God's positioning this church. God's moving this church. Not in the direction that you would move it, but in the direction that God would move it. God said, it's a strange land, but I can have a church in a strange land. And he's positioning. I, I don't just say this, but I want to talk to you tonight. There is an absolute un unmeasurable gush of the Holy Ghost that I feel in the womb of this church. There is potential to do something that Memphis has never seen done before. There is a shaking in the Holy Ghost and God's doing it by positioning you for revival. Clap your hands with me. So Nebuchadnezzar moved the people. He stole their music. He separated Judah. He taught them false doctrine. He taught them everything except what God had called them to be. When you study that, you will find that part, part of the mind game that Nebuchadnezzar played was that when he would take a family, he wouldn't kill the whole family. He would touch part of the family. Many times, you read this, read it in your history. Many times during Babylonian captivity, he would take a family and he would kill one member of the family and he would make the other family march on the, on the slaughtered body of the other family. Every family was touched. It was part of his psychological warfare. I'm not gonna wipe them all out, but I want every family touched. I want every, I wanna crawl in the brain of every family. I wanna crawl in the fabric of every family. I wanna crawl in the mind of every family. I'm preaching to you right now. That's why the last two and a half 
years uh, we have been assaulted, not physically, although we've dealt with that, but the assault's been on the mind. It's been on the spirit. Fear. Fear has had talons deep uh, and people afraid. Do I have church? Do I not have church? Uh, do I bring people? Do I not bring people? Do I teach a Bible study? Do I not teach a Bible study? Do I lay hands on them? Do I not lay hands on them? I'm going to talk to somebody tonight. We are living in a strange land. Uh, we're in such a strange land uh, that, that, that a Supreme Court justice uh, doesn't even know how to define what a woman is. Can I preach the way I want to tonight? We're in a strange land where today people can be who whatever they identify as. It's a strange land. And if we are not careful, we're going to learn how to shout and dance when we're inside this tabernacle. But when we walk outside in Babylon, the confusion is going to cause us to hang up our harp. And the confusion is going to want to shut us down. And the confusion is going to try and get us to hide from who we really are. But I've come to preach to somebody tonight. It doesn't matter how ugly it's been. It doesn't matter how dark it's been. It doesn't matter how bad it's been. I feel the Holy Ghost tell me to tell somebody it's time to get up from where you are and pick up your harp. Get it off the willow and learn how to worship God with absolute abandon again. Oh, let's worship him together. Come on, worship him with me. No, come on, let's really worship him. Let's love him. Let's talk to him. And in this shifting time of the last 30 months, I've watched men and women wither. Men that used to have authority and power. Men that had an unction and an anointing. I've seen women used of God. Women that were highly favored of God get caught in the wave of Babel, not knowing, is it true, is it not true? Do I wear a mask, do I not wear a mask? Do I get a vaccine, do I not get a vaccine? Never in my 64 plus years have I ever seen America so confused. Never in my entire life have I looked in the faces of young men that are trying to toy with the idea, am I a man, am I a woman? Am I a boy, am I a girl? How do I feel right now? How am I gonna feel tomorrow? I'm gonna preach truth to you. And whether you are ready for it or not, it is the culture of our age to do its best to wrest us from everything established any fixed points of righteousness. Uh, that's why God's positioning this church. Uh, we cannot afford to sit down uh, in the middle of this age. Uh, we cannot hang our harp upon a willow. Somebody has got to find their song again. Somebody's got to find their anointing again. Somebody's got to find the touch of God again in their life. Come on now, let's pray again. Let's pray, let's pray. Let's pray again. Come on, open your mouth. Let's talk to him. Hallelujah. 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 A wounded soldier is a far greater disadvantage to an army than a dead one. A dead one takes at least four men to take care of them, a, a wounded one, at least four. A dead one requires none. I'm preaching tonight, and I'm gonna preach this till I get this out of my spirit. I'm preaching to the lives of great people. I am preaching to a church that is pregnant with destiny tonight. I am preaching to a church that has the heavy hand of God upon you. But I'm also preaching to people that have got caught with the different winds that have blown. 
the last 20 plus months. I'm preaching to people that somehow have lost their shout and lost their vibrancy. I'm preaching to good men and good women and good families that somehow have lost themselves in the shuffle of what is and what isn't. But God sent me to preach you a little message tonight. You cannot wait for the world to get perfect because it's never going to get perfect again. You cannot wait to go back to normal because what you're dealing with right now is normal from here on. You can't wait till it to get back to where it was before the last 30 months. What you got to do is get back a hold of your anointing and your calling and say, God, although I'm in Babylon, I'm not going to give in to the spirit of confusion. You're not going to get into my mind. You're not going to get into my spirit. Pastor Adams, it's time to build. It's time to dream. It's time to take property. It's time to take authority. But there's going to be minds that say, I don't know if it's time yet. It'll never be a better time. There'll never be a greater moment. There'll never be a greater hour. you got to get that out of your spirit and say, let me find my heart. They flew drones over our church. The police flew drones over our church. The police showed up in our parking lots. I know them. I've known them for 30 years, close to it. They said, Pastor, I'm sorry. We have to show up. We have to show up. You've been reported. I said, yeah, yeah. He said, but we're not going to do anything. We're just showing up. We're not going to touch you. We're just showing up. I said, how, how come? How come you're not going to arrest us? How come you're not going to shut us down? And we, we, had th we have that kind of relationship because I know what this church means to our city. I know what this church means to our neighborhood. I know what this church means to families. Uh, you guys are getting drug addicts off the street. You're getting alcoholics off the street. You're getting, you're getting perps off the street. We can't shut this thing down. This is the only bright light. I'm, I'm preaching right now. I'm preaching right now. It's Pablo. It's I'm going to walk through you. I'm going to get in your mind. I'm going to get in your spirit. But I'm going to preach to you right now. It is a strange land. But I'm going to sing my song. I don't care how crazy it gets. I don't care how ugly it gets. I'm not about to back, back up. I'm not about to pack up my music. I'm not about to hang on my harp. It's revival time. It's time to build a church in Henderson. It's time to have revival. It's time to have revival in Memphis. It's not time to sit down. One of the things that we're doing the next month, we're trying to finish our headquarters building. God's given us favor. We're finishing the third story, which is a men's dorm and restrooms and a couple apartments and just before we left, we left last time, we had just about put the finishing touches on the sanctuary, a sanctuary close to this size, and it wasn't done, it's not dedicated, wasn't finished painting, platform hadn't been built, but we didn't know about COVID. I said, we'll see you in about 90 days, we'll get this thing done. It's been two and a half years. But let me tell you what's happened the last two and a half years. The young people, the young people that says, well, if we can't go to school, we can go to the street. If we can't have school, we can have Sunday school. And so the youth of that church, the church that we haven't dedicated, the church that we hadn't finished, the youth begin to have revival in the street. In the midst of COVID, they were out there in the streets. People are dying all around them with guitars and, and tambourines and singing and reaching children. Children started getting the Holy Ghost. 10 children got the Holy Ghost. Then 20 got the Holy Ghost. Then 50 got the Holy Ghost. And then 100 got the Holy Ghost. And these kids are going back home talking in tongues. And mom and dad saying, what's wrong? And they said, I got the Holy Ghost. And them little babies started bringing mom and dad back to the house of God. We haven't even dedicated it. 
and they've already packed it out. It's already too small. They've already filled it up. I'm going to talk to somebody right now. You don't sit down, Memphis. It's time to get back up. I said it's time to get back up. It's time to get back to that harp and say, I will bless the Lord at all time and his praise. Can I, can I preach a few more moments? It's time you get off your pew. I said it's time you get off your pew. I'm going to preach to somebody right now. It's time you knock the dust off your Bible study chart. It's time you start knocking doors. It's time you start buying more buses and building more bus routes. It's time that Memphis gets rocked. I don't know what's going on, but that church over there, they won't quit. They won't shut up. We've tried to get in their mind. We've tried to get in their emotions. We've tried to control them with fear, but they keep playing that harp. They keep singing the songs of Zion. They keep magnifying God and look at what is going on. Hang up your harp. Remember what happened to Saul when you played your harp? Hang up your harp. You remember when evil spirits used to trouble you and you get alone in the Holy Ghost and that harp would drive the devil away? Hang up your harp. How many times has God used you? How many times has the Holy Ghost flown through you? Hang up your harp. Don't you remember that cool chill of anointing running down your spine? Hang up your harp. It ain't time to hang it up. It's not time to retire it. It's not time to hand it off. It's time to get back. I'm preaching right Right now, the thing you need to do is get up. The first step in getting back involved is get up. Get out of fear. Get out of confusion. Get back on your feet. Get your hands back in the air. Say, Pastor Adams, you play it. I'll sing it. You lead it. I'll follow. But I won't hang my harp on a willow. Lift your voice, let's love him. Come on, I need you to help me right now. Come on. I need to hear the prayer of Sunday school teachers right now. Come on, we witnessed today what happens when you don't hang it up. We witnessed this morning what happens when you said, I don't care if I'm in Babylon, and I don't care what Nebuchadnezzar is saying. I don't care. I'm still going to drive that bus. I'm still going to knock door. I'm still going to bring him to the house of God. And when you do, God's going to reach them. God's going to fill them. God's going to change them. God's going to use them. The adversary realizes, keyboards come help me. The adversary realizes that he doesn't have to cause you to fall in moral failure to remove your effectiveness. The spirit of Babylon understands you don't have to have a breakup in your home to render you ineffective in the kingdom of God. Because Babel's not Egypt. Egypt presses your flesh. But Babel works on your mind. That hidden chamber of us all. That that no one sees behind our tie or dress or hairdo or lack thereof. It's the unspoken. I don't know if I still have it. I don't know if God can use me. I don't know if I have good time left. Are my best days behind me? I'm preaching to you. That's Babel. Pastor Adams, the scripture teaches 
that God's going to have to shorten the time in order that the very elect don't be deceived. How does that work? I'll tell you how it works. Deception is the fruit of confusion. You stay confused. You open yourself up to deception. You stay confused. You begin to question, is it or isn't it? Do I need to or do I not need to? I know what I'm preaching right now. Does it really take this or does it not take this? I am preaching to a church that doesn't have the benefit that a lot of churches have. That can just have good church and go home and feel like you're doing what God's called you to do. Not this church. There is destiny upon you. There's a calling of God upon this church. You can't just have good church and get by. I'm preaching to people that used to play, but you've hung up your harp. I'm preaching to people that used to sing, but confusion has made you silent. So they that carried us away captive, they captured me. They got me. So sing now. Sing now. Try your song now. Try your song now when you're being mocked. Try your song now when everybody's looking at you. Try your song now. Sing that song now in this climate, in this culture. I don't know who I'm preaching to right now, but I'm begging you, don't stay seated. Don't let Babylon get you so confused that you lose your direction, you lose your anointing, you lose your purpose in life. You got to learn how to find your feet again and say, I'm getting back up. It's a strange land, but I can still live for God. I'm preaching to young people today. It's a strange land you're living in when boys can compete with girls. It's a strange land. It's a strange land with everything that we call holy, they mock. It's a strange land that everything we call right, they say is wrong. But I don't care how strange it is. I still got a song to sing. I still got a job to do. I still got a God that I love. I still got a Holy Ghost that's burning in my spirit. So get up. Get up from where you are. And so, Nebuchadnezzar never said, if I could just keep them separate. But there was three of them that didn't get divided. Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. Somehow they slipped under the radar. They said, bro, I ain't going nowhere. Go get a old pastor over there. We ain't going nowhere. I don't care what they say. I don't care what they preach. I don't care what they scream. I don't care how bad Nebuchadnezzar gets. I don't care how crazy it gets. I ain't letting you go, brother, because you're my brother. I'm not letting you go. They're not going to separate us. They're not going to divide us. They're not coming between us. It ain't going to happen. We're going to stick together. In an environment of confusion, three men saying, you can pipe, you can harp, you can build towers, you can build monuments, you can pass decrees. Whatever want a mandate you want to make, whatever you want to, you can do what you want. But I'm not bowing my knee to Baal. I'm not forgetting Jehovah God. I'm not surrendering who I am in Him. 
Nebuchadnezzar in his fury commanded the furnace to be hot, heated seven times hotter than hot. I don't understand that. Hot, hot. I don't get seven times hotter than hot. Can you help me? Hot, hot. But in the middle of the hot, I see Nebuchadnezzar scratching his head saying, those people, those people, those people. Didn't we put three of them in there? Those people. Just when I think I got them, those people. Just when I think I got that family, those people. Just when I thought I had that marriage, those people. Just when I thought I had those kids, those people. Somebody heard an old song. Somebody lifted up their voice again. I heard in the night hours the sound of a harp again. And Nebuchadnezzar said, didn't we put three in that fire? I've counted 15 times and I still see four. And that fourth one looks like God, them people's God. I'm preaching to you in closing. It doesn't matter where you are, who you are, what you've been through. Your mind's going to get clear when you get back on your feet. The storm's going to pass when you get back up. And when you get up, right in front of you is your harp. When you get back up, right in front of you is your prayer closet. When you get back up, right in front of you is a Sunday school class. When you get back up, right in front of you is a bus route and bus kids and young people getting filled with the Holy Ghost. You just got to get up. Lift your hands with me to him. In fact, take the hand of the neighbor next to you if you would. This is what I want you to pray. God, it's a strange land. It's a strange time. It's a strange season. But I got to get my head back up. Pray for your sister. God, help her get her head back up. Pray for a brother. God, let him find his song again. Come on, I'm preaching to people. The Holy Ghost has been dealing with you. It's time to plug back into prayer. It's time to plug back into the walk of the Holy Ghost. It's time to plug back into being used of God. Come on. It's not time to fold the tent. It's not time to sit down. It's time to get back up. Find your harp. Find your song. Drive confusion out of your brain. Drive it out of your mind. Drive fear out of your family. And say it's revival time in Memphis. It's time to have a move of the Holy Ghost. While they begin to sing this chorus, would you take that hand and say, come and go with me. I want us to come and stand around this altar right now. I want this entire church to tell God, God, we're up. We're up. We're up. We're not down. We're up. We're finding our harp again. This morning was a breakthrough service. God troubled waters in this tabernacle. Hear me today. Hear me. Hear me. It's only a full steam ahead. It's only up from where you are. You got to get up. Find that harp. Find that anointing. Find that touch of God. That's it. Pray for your neighbor. Pray. Pray in the Holy Ghost. Use them again, God. Anoint them again, God. My family again, God. Use anything, Lord. You can use me. Use me. You use me. Can use anything, Lord. You can use, use, me. use me. Rejoice not against me, oh my enemy. For when I fall, take I shall hands, arise. Lord, when I sit in darkness, the Lord shall be a light unto me. Lord, it's time to recover. It's time to regroup. Sing it, sing it from the depths of your person. You can you use, use anything, Lord. You can use me. Use me. Oh, you can use anything.
in California. Listen, we live in a weird state. Forty million people in California. That's over 10% of the population of the nation. 330 million in America. Over 40 million in California. They were patrolling the streets. I, I ran media trucks out of our parking lot. I don't know how many times get out of here. It's private property. Get out of here. It's private property. What are you having church? Get out of here. It's private property. But walking in off the streets in the year of 2020, we baptized over 70 people that nobody had ever said a word to that walked in off the street and said, I saw you were having church. in a continual state of revival. Can, can, I, can I help somebody right now? Pastors of other churches coming. Other churches have been sold. They've been shut down. They've been locked up. It's our greatest moment to have revival right now. I don't know who you are. That's immaterial. I know whose you are. God's wanting to lay his hand upon you. I need to see the hands of people that really want to be used for revival like you've never been used. I'm serious. Come on. Would you pray a desperate prayer with me right now? Would you pray it? Our world's confused, God. It's crazy outside these walls. You gotta use me. Come on, pray it. Use me now, right now, God. Right now. I gotta shut the door of my past. I gotta shut the door of what I used to do. Use me. Use me. Use me. We gotta reach our city. We gotta build a house for God. We gotta reach our city. But I want to sing. It's a strange hour, but I want to sing. Now let's join with him and sing this song together as a prayer. Can you use anything, Lord? Touch my heart Pastor Adam, I don't know where all God's going to take you in this church. But there are churches strategically placed all around the world that other churches navigate by. I told you before, you don't have the luxury of just having good church. 
and going home and eating pizza because there's way too many people navigating by you. Your worship, your character, your word, the way you conduct yourself. I beg you to hear me tonight. In Jesus' name, don't sit down. Thank God you're not where you used to be, but for God's sake, don't stop here. You have no idea where you're headed. It's bigger than this. It's bigger than you. It's to reach a world. So all hands on deck. Everybody grab their sword in one hand and their harp in the other. Say, we're going to do the will of God. It may get crazier, but I'm still going to worship. It may be crazier, but I'm still going to live for God. It may be crazier, but I'm still going to do the will of God. I'll sit down when he says, well done. But in, in the meantime, if you could use anything. Anything, Lord, you can use me. Use me. Lay your hand on their shoulder next to you and sing this. Take my hand. Take my hand. Take my feet. Take my feet. Touch my heart and speak through me. Pray an anointing you on your brother right anything, now. Anything, Lord, Pray an anointing on your sister. Don't let him sit down. Use them. Use them. Can use it if you use them, Lord. Use them. Use the youth group. Anoint them powerfully. Let preachers come out of this house. Let missionaries come out of this house. Let preachers' wives come out of this house. Use me. Take my hands, Lord, in my feet. Touch my heart and speak to me. Well, we have heard, we have heard a word right from the, right from the throne room of heaven. And man, we've heard some of this before, haven't we? Amen. God is, I think God is impressing on us as a people the, the gravity of our responsibility. When we do things right. We need every member of this church and Engage in the work of the Lord and what that looks like tomorrow find somebody you work with you can pray for get a scripture on your mind when you're reading your Bible tomorrow and just talk about that scripture somebody you work with text somebody tomorrow after you've prayed for them and say look I just want you to know I'm praying for you you don't have to be a theologian to do any of that you don't have to be a great expert in the scriptures to pray for people, to love them and reach out. And if you got a whole church full of people reaching out and just touching people, it's amazing the amount of souls we can reach. And God's going to put some people on your mind and you're going to reach out to them and it's going to be just at the right time. And they're going to be ready to hear the word of God ready to be converted and so let's do that let's keep our faith high let's walk in unity and harmony with one another if somebody does you wrong forgive them and get over it <laughs> hallelujah